Australia, an island, a continent and a country. The sixth biggest country in the world, with the largest coastline on Earth. A landmass of over seven and a half million square kilometres. Australia lies at the bottom of the globe, surrounded by the Pacific, Indian and Southern Oceans. Isolated beaches border a landscape vast and varied. From coastal beaches to farming plains, to deserts and snow-capped mountain ranges. Australia is divided into states and territories. Its major cities are contrasted by wide open spaces of central Australia. There are major engineering and mining projects in operation in the middle of nowhere and spectacular farmland produces food which is exported all over the world. This is Big Australia. Australia's northern state of Queensland makes up almost one quarter of Australia's landmass. Its coastline is famous with holiday makers from all over the world, but some 2,000 kilometres inland is Australia's Gulf farming country. The people who live here are unique. Resilient, passionate farmers working their land, producing beef cattle for the local and export market. Milungra Station is one of those farms. It's a mammoth million acres of grazing land with 35,000 head of cattle to be mustered. For someone that's never been into the Queensland Outback, I, I suppose it's as close thing to paradise as you get. In this story of Australia, we ride along with the helicopter pilots and the stock men and women as they muster, yard and sort their herd. This property is big. It's one of the world's biggest family farms in a country where cattle outnumber the human population. This is Big Australia. The Acton family have been here in Australia since uh, the early uh, 1860s. My great-grandfather, William Acton, had a thousand acres, and now Evan and I uh, own approximately uh, some four million acres in Queensland. Evan and Graham Acton are brothers running one of the country's biggest beef cattle empires. They both have a love affair with the Australian outback. It gives you a thrill to be able to look out over paddocks with a thousand cows in and, and have them nice and quiet and beautiful uh, red Santa cattle or grey brahm and Charolais cross cattle. And yeah, it's, uh, you know, be, being a fourth generation uh, graziers and cattle producers in Australia from an Irish background, uh, you know, we, we've sort of had a, uh, a long association with the rural side of things a long way back through our family's history. We've uh, expanded over the last uh, 150 years to uh, from the Rockhampton region where we first started our family to the uh, Northern Territory Queensland border. Cattle numbers vary a bit uh, depending upon the seasons. You know, our herd ranges from 150 to 180,000 head of cattle. Dad and Uncle Graham and, and their brothers when they were younger and, and their granddad, their father, um, they were all built a pretty good empire for themselves, Dad and Uncle Graham together. And... The Actons own seven properties, almost four million acres of cattle country. That's 15,000 square kilometres. 267 times bigger than Manhattan Island. Milunga itself is 68 times bigger. Mm -hmm. 
it takes more than three hours to drive around the perimeter of Malungra. Forget cars, you need helicopters here to work this property. Senior pilot Kent Hansen has worked with the Actons for more than 20 years. A lot of these paddocks, they're, they're so big and, and physically man on a horse uh, or man on the ground can't cover the country. Malunga is big, it's a million acres and the homestead is in the bottom southern corner. So when the men do go mustering they often have to travel a long way because it's about a 90 to 100 kilometres to the back of the property. But just, just the scale of things and the amount of cattle is quite amazing out here. It's just huge and you can just, you'll drive down the road and you can't even see what's in front of you. The road just keeps going, it looks like it's going to drop off at the end, but you'll always get somewhere. <laughs> People get overawed by the size of it. There's a lot of place a lot bigger than this and a lot of place a lot smaller, but I just look at it, it's a, it's a lot of quarter acre blocks. We didn't know about places this big where we grew up, so it's quite amazing. Milungra currently has 35,000 head of cattle scattered across this vast property. Twice a year, each beast needs to be mustered or herded into cattle yards and then grouped by sex and age. Milungra Station sits north of the Tropic of Capricorn. On Milungra, we have a, a definite wet season. It starts with storms about late October, early November, a lot of years. Uh, a lot of electrical storms can cause some fires, big heavy storms that cover small, smaller areas. And then you get through to, to January, February, and you get the monsoonal influences which cover the whole area, the whole Gulf area, and uh, can ha cause major flooding. In the wet season, Malungra is often isolated due to floods across the station. Helicopters and light planes are vital to bring in supplies. On a cattle station like this, the dry season is the only time to muster. It is indeed the busiest time of year and everybody has a role to play to ensure this cattle muster is completed without a hitch. The day of the muster arrives. It takes a team of around 40 people to get the job done. Everyone is up before dawn breaks, ready for the huge day in front of them. Well, obviously, first thing before the sun comes up, get all the horses saddled up and you've got to start in the dark because it, it takes about an hour, a bit more than an hour to get out to where we're going, because it's about 70 odd kilometres. So they're headed out already and um, so they can get out and in position before the helicopters go. The key to this muster is the use of helicopters. Safety checks and preparations occur before the sun rises. They don't fly until they can see, just on daybreak. Doesn't take them too long, 20 minutes or so to get out there. All ready to go when the, 
when it's daylight and everyone can see. Evan and Graham Acton manage the Acton Beef Empire, but mustering cattle is in their blood. It's what they love best. We're going out to start our normal uh, cattle operation. We uh, do two rounds a year of mustering here at Malunga and, and most of the cattle stations in Western Queensland are the same. Going out to muster green hull paddock here on Malungwa this morning, which is a paddock that runs about 3,000 Santa Gertrudis cows and all their progeny. And the purpose of the muster is to uh, to take all the wieners off, brand the calves, and identify the empty cows by preg testing. And take the empty fat cows off and. Uh, and market them. Graham and Evan are anxious to get working and bring the mob in. Through the division fence you'll be able to let them go then. Well Malunga is a million acres of grazing land. We run around 35,000 head of branded cattle here at any one time. We have had up to 40,000 cattle. They spread out uh, in wide areas over the country because of the fact that we are very lucky. We've got 23 artesian bores and uh, they're free-flowing bores. Some of them are capped and flow into 100 kilometres odds of uh, two, uh, two and three inch poly pipe. And the rest of them flow down bore drains up to five or 600 kilometres of bore drains still on Malunga. With the master, we have the helicopters, a couple of helicopters in a big paddock like this one, bringing the cattle into the horsemen and then the horsemen driving them along to a designated yard. The muster takes place 70 kilometres northeast of the farmhouse in the paddock known as Green Holes. But this is no ordinary paddock with a circumference of about 100 kilometres. This one paddock is bigger than most farms in other parts of the world. There is an estimated three and a half thousand cattle scattered throughout this single paddock. Today's job is to gather the cattle into what is known as the mob. They're scattered in small groups, so it's a gigantic task to bring them together. Three helicopters will be needed. The cattle are pushed into the centre of the paddock known as the lane. This is where the stockmen and women on horseback play their part, driving the cattle through the lane to the cattle yards some 10 kilometres away. Yeah, today we've got, we've got a, a con contracting crew, which Luke, Luke runs. Uh, he's got a handful of Aboriginal fellas, pretty handy sort of fellas on the ground, and uh, he, he's in charge of all those boys. Um, so he'll be out there today doing a good, good job, keeping everyone in line and making sure things done, are done properly. And then from our permanent staff, we've got um, Elliot. He's been here three years, and he sort of knows the run of things, and, and Heidi, it's her second year, and um, yeah, they know know the deal. And my role is head stockman and mentor for the Indigenous boys. You've always got to work in a team because if someone's not pulling their weight, then something always goes wrong. But generally, you just try and keep the mob together and if something goes away you communicate so everyone knows where everyone is. The first job is to group by group locate the 3,000 cattle. The stockmen can then take over. 
we're constantly on the on the radios talking to each other, so we we know where each other is at, at all times. They're just coming up behind you there now. Sometimes if if uh, one runs into trouble, you know, with the, with the cattle, um, one of us can go out and give them a hand. Mustering pilots are a breed unto themselves. The skills implemented here are unique. Basically, uh, you know, I, I left school at 15. I never finished school and uh, went straight up into the Gulf and, and worked on places up there. And, um, you know, pretty early on I could see that there was, there was a better future or a better way to make money, and, but still wanting to be associated with, with, uh, with the land. We used to run one of the properties and now we fly a helicopter and get involved with the mustering. Both Kent and Ben are former stockmen with intimate knowledge of the mustering process from the ground and the air. They'll have to retrieve red cattle camouflaged on red soil. Some are hiding in shadows of shrubs and trees. When you're flying around, you're just constantly focused, like looking in shadows for cattle pulled up in timber. If it's not a, a cloudy, cloudy day, there's not many shadows, cattle are easier to see. Yeah, we use the Robinson R22, they're made over there in the US. They're very light, quick uh, machine, very reliable. They're a small two-seater, so they can get in some tight, tight areas. It's uh, the easiest helicopter to learn to fly. It's the most common train helicopter people train in. The operating cost of them is uh, probably up around the $200 an hour. And they're the most economical to run. That's, uh, that's why we use the uh, 22 Feeding the workers at the end of the day is a huge operation, and mustering can build up a large appetite. Every stockman on the muster can't wait for the end of the day for their evening meal. But the kitchen has fallen silent. We have a wonderful cook that's been with us for 11 years, and she's just taken a month to go on a cruise. So I had a, an English chef come to replace a cook while she was away. And unfortunately, it didn't work out very well at all. And I found out on Friday that he had disappeared off the face of the earth. And the cook is the core of the station. The men are not happy. So there's a lot of very unhappy people if they're not fed properly or enough. We bought Belanga in uh, July 1985 and we were looking to expand. Dad and my older brother Graham and the younger brother Alan were in Acton Land, the cattle company. For the Acton brothers, the importance of family underpins the entire business. We moved here in 85 when I was three. Sometimes when there wasn't too much work on, we'd get up to a bit of mischief and kept Dad on his toes, I suppose. They'll uh, hopefully uh, follow on in, in my footsteps and my father's and then uh, they have shown a lot of interest in the rural industry. The Actons are very big on family because every day what they're working for is for their children and grandchildren. They really work very hard to make their parents proud of what they've done today. Just two for you, Tommy, these ones. Hey, hey. Evan's son, Philip, and Graham's son, Thomas, are the fifth generation of Actons to work in the family business. I was never going to do anything else other than this. Uh, I mean, I probably had the opportunity to if I wanted, but I no, this is all I ever wanted to do. Girl. Dad said um, when I was going to school, in Rocky, Dad said, don't let school interfere with the education too much. <laughs> so, so I, yeah, I was only ever going to do this, yeah. With your next door neighbour around 100 kilometres away, growing up in the Australian outback provides a special type of upbringing and the sixth generation is already immersed in farm life. I don't know, I just think it's everything you could ask for, bringing up a kid on a station. 
There's hardly any boundaries for Thomas, you know. He can, he's got a million acre backyard. What else can you ask for? People dream about a lifestyle like this and we've got it right, you know. We're so blessed to, to live here and yeah, I love it. It's a family involvement that inspires you to keep going and keep achieving and uh, expanding, providing uh, a livelihood for our children and our grandchildren to come. It is very much a family business and we're very proud of the fact that uh, the next generation, the fifth generation of Actons and also the sixth generation are showing a great interest in the land and following on from their fathers and grandfathers and great grandfathers footsteps. Helicopters have made mustering much more efficient. Greenhold's paddock would have taken a week to muster without them. This is now achieved in just one day. Uh, helicopters have, uh, in my experience, have changed a lot in the last 30 years. I can remember and recall very clearly the first day that we mustered the double swamp paddock here at Malungra some 25 years ago. I'd never been in a helicopter before. And I was petrified. And after that, you gradually become accustomed, as you do, and uh, it's a great enjoyment to be able to fly around in a helicopter and look at the cattle being mustered, and they're all running in nicely into mobs, and uh, it gives us a great deal of satisfaction. Our son-in-law, Ben Hutton, flies uh, our helicopter, and uh, obviously it's a worry when they're flying around, especially if the weather's bad. But, uh, you know, they've had very good training and we've made sure that uh, he's been trained by our senior pilot, Kent Hansen, which has had a wealth of experience for 20 years. And when people have been trained correctly and uh, they've been given uh, confidence to, to do the job, it makes it a lot better. While mustering has allowed for greater efficiencies for cattle farmers in Australia, there are dangers. Pilots are well aware that helicopter crashes are a real possibility. Frequently, they fly in what is known as the dead man's zone. The dead man's zone, we're constantly in that in, in our game, um, and it's the ratio between the height speed ratio. Um, so basically, if you're if you're at 50 foot hovering uh, with zero airspeed, uh, you're right in the middle of the, the dead man's curve. It's called that because if uh, the engine fails or you had a mechanical failure of any sort, um, you're not going to get out of it. Sometimes you have to hover low near trees, which is not the best spot to be in. To fly safely and, uh, you know, airspeed and heights and uh, we're in a bad spot. If you do have to be low and close to the trees, you try and keep moving, so you've got an airspeed on your side. Um, the odd time you have to hover above a tree to chase a bull out or something, but you just try and not be there long. When I went through flying school, uh, there was about 20 20 of us went through school and uh, there's three or four of them aren't with us anymore, so. It means pilots never get accustomed to the threat of danger. Oh, I guess it's, you know, you don't, uh, you don't stop driving a car if someone has an accident in a car, so I guess you, you've got to think of it like that and, and um, just deal with it, learn to deal with it. Helicopters have now successfully started to bring the cattle together into a mob. The stockmen and their horses go into formation and build a virtual wall, surrounding and then pushing the mob forward. All the while, the helicopters continue to add more and more cattle into the lane, increasing the size of the mob being driven forward in the oppressive outback sun.
with the continuous buzzing of helicopters overhead, there's a risk the mob could split. The pilots need to be absolutely sure there are no cattle left behind. The stockmen concentrating on ensuring not one beast breaks through the wall. If one gets free, others are bound to follow and the mob could scatter. The choppers put them all together, then we're on the ground crew, puts them all into us, and then we sort of head off to the yard and as we're going towards the yards, he keeps bringing them into us, making sure none break out and get away and keeping it all together and making sure the carbs come along. I'm the leading hand here and the leading hand just makes sure that everyone knows what they're doing every morning. Luke's in charge of all the boys, but I'm in charge of how the muster goes. Steady him there, boys. Steady, steady. Yeah, I think Elliot's dreams to be a head stockman, but he, he just needs a bit more uh, putting on the right track, I suppose, a few more years' experience. As the sun rises higher in the sky, so does the friendly rivalry between the two lead stockmen. Luke's only come here this year and uh, Elliot's been here a lot longer, so I think there's a bit of a bit of tension between the fella that's done it for longer and the fella that's done it on this property for longer. So I think they'll work it out, they just have to uh, find some common ground there somewhere. Hey Elliot, when I go to go back in the mob, mate, see if we can get out of the way, eh? Because he's been here uh, longer than us on, on, on Malunga and he came out just to show us the horses and that. And um, I've just been rubbing him up and, and getting him along and taking a lot of slack out of him. Hey. He's like the experienced old man that knows everything and I, I sort of always think I know better than him. Like he's just a silly old bugger and all these old old ways are all just old fashioned, you know, like, yeah. Hey, swap your places, mate. Swap your places. Hey, God, what? He just... Well, we got a trough up here, bud. Hey, 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 hey! Hey, Alan. Let, let a cowboy get it for you, mate. There you go. There you go. Some consider this part of Australia God's country. Perhaps they're right. There are hundreds of kilometres of bore drains that snake their way across the million acre property. Water flows freely from the wells dug 30 metres from below the red surface. We are very lucky we've got 23 artesian bores. The monsoonal rains flood these plains each year and each dry season the drains must be recarved to keep the water flowing through the trenches. But they're well controlled, it's a full-time job for a man to uh, keep the bore drains in order. I think there's about 600 kilometres of drain all up, I think, if I remember rightly. So that, uh, that'll keep me busy for the next couple of months. I've just got to keep them clean to keep the water running. Uh, do it now while it's cooler, so when summer comes on the cattle are right for water and uh, there's no problems. I'll be 68 this year at Christmas time and I can't see any sense in knocking off work when I enjoy doing what I'm doing and I'm not getting flogged to do it. One of the least desirable jobs for most on a million acre property is that of the lonely greater driver. Oh, Kevin Nash. I just operate the greater here doing all the, like, the roads and fence lines and fire breaks. 
There is a network of roads across Malungra that must be maintained. The wet season rains flood the region, making it impossible for heavy road trains to transport their cargo of prime beef cattle. Keeping the trucks moving is a big responsibility for Nashi. They, turn, they get all rutted up and trucks get bogged and do them again. That's what's happened along here. This has been done twice. We had rain two weeks ago and just destroyed the roads. Oh, Kevin, the greater driver. Uh, Kevin and I grew up together. Um, Kevin doesn't say much. You, you're lucky to get any words out of him, I suppose. Yeah. It's lucky Kevin enjoys his own company. He spends weeks at a time alone smoothing out the roads and without a day off. Yeah, I haven't seen a TV for two months. Yeah, just listen to the radio. Listen to the news and go to bed. Yeah. He visits the homestead around every couple of weeks to refuel and restock and to wash his clothes. You probably do five or six k's a day to form it up properly, you know. Best to do that before the wet. I'll probably move out a bit further and take the caravan, stay out there and be there a week or so, then move a bit further. You just move all over the place here. Life of a greater driver, pretty lonely. And uh, for me, it'd be boring. I'm, I'm, I'd rather ride a horse. But for Nashi, it's just the way he likes it. Travelling at five kilometres an hour, he's got hundreds of kilometres of roads north to prepare for the next muster. Just Nashi towing his ute and his fuel for the weeks ahead. With the muster in full swing, back at the farmhouse, Kim is growing increasingly anxious with the kitchen. The fill-in cook is nowhere to be seen and nothing prepared for the evening meal with 25 hungry stockmen and women to feed. To make matters worse, Kim has broken her collarbone in a horse fall and she can't help out as much as she hoped. He never said a word, he never told us, but we knew he, he wasn't the right person for the position and I think he realised that and um, he, he just disappeared. Yes, I heard that he was on the bus and gone. If the cook's happy, everyone's happy and the cook is the core of the station to keep everything going. But a quick 200 kilometre return trip into the nearest town has the problem solved. A new cook, an English backpacker, is hired. We have this young fella has come for the next three weeks to help us out. He's very pleasant and he's so willing to listen and learn and to be helped. There's a lot of different things to catch up on and to find out where everything is. A lot of stuff to learn to make because it's a bit different out here than back holes. But yeah, that's just the main thing, just getting used to where everything is and how much people want to eat and stuff like that. I worked as a chef for four months, as a sous chef, so I was just an assistant chef in a seafood restaurant. So I was just learning lots, lots of stuff about seafood, which is not very great out here, because it's all meat-based. But yeah, so it's all right, it's going good. I'm so grateful to have him. He came at the last minute to help us out, and he did tell us that he was a Muslim and he couldn't eat meat if it wasn't killed halal. Well, naturally, our meat's not killed halal, so he's more than happy to be a vegetarian while he's here. So that's, that's very nice of him. Everyone's so looking forward to the beautiful things he's going to produce for dessert. And it'll be a lovely change for him too, cooking lots of beef. With the news reaching those out mustering that food is on the table, the 10 kilometre cattle trek continues with renewed vigour. As Luke was really um, trying to keep us in a line at the back today. A lot easier if you keep a straight line. Come on, buddy. Good one. Fast as the slowest beast, Cotbot. Fast as the slowest beast, my friend. So yeah, so I guess it makes it easier on us as well as the cattle that they don't have to run back as much and our horses don't get as tired. Ready, ready. A few broke away, so he um, sent a few of the boys after and get around them, put them back in.
priority is to get out there and get them back as, before they get any further away um, without disturbing the rest of the cattle. We have uh, two-way contact all the time, so they, if we can't see something run away, they call us and let us know, or if they can't see something, we spot it, we, and we think a horse is the best for the job, we get him out there as quick as possible, and you just work as one big team, yeah. It's better to be able to block a cow from running out before it does rather than letting it run out, you know, like you should see it before it happens. A natural instinct is really important, but overall it just takes experience, like, and having someone that's patient enough to show you helps a lot, which I've had, so, yeah, it's been really good. The afternoon lunch break is welcomed by everyone. A time to relax and regroup ahead of the final push to the cattle yards. There is a special bond that exists between the land and those who work in Outback Australia, but nothing compares to that of the bond between these stockmen and their horses. There are hundreds of horses on the property. They're a vital part of Outback life. Horses are used for the muster, but also for recreation. I've grown up with horses and um, they're part of my life and always will be. I love working with them and competing on them and that. So I've got my favourite horses here. I've got one, I didn't ride him today. But um, I was lucky enough I'm able to camp draft on him and he's, he's lovely. We have a few moments where we don't get along but we're always friends and yeah, he's brilliant. Horses have always been a part of life for Graham and Evan. Uh, we like our staff to be kind and treat our an animals with kindness and respect as we do. And uh, we love our horses as you've seen and our cattle particularly the horses, and uh, I always say a horse is a man's best friend. The final push has commenced. The herd is in its 10th hour of being driven towards the yard. The herd is slowing, the calves are tiring, and some cannot go on. Put him up on top of you. Uh, today when we're mustering, um, there, there's a trader pulling a trailer full of all the um, calves that are knocking up. They're not going to make it to the yard, they're small and they're young and they're just getting tired. So we put them in the trailer and bring them to the yard to save them walking in and at least you know they've, they've made it here. Hey, 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 hey. One just got tired and I guess I was just too lazy to carry it over so I just put it on the front of my horse and carried it over to the trailer. Hey, 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 hey! The mob stretches nearly a kilometre, creating a plume of dust that can be seen for miles and restricts visibility for pilots. The first of the cattle into the yard But senior pilot Kent Hansen has noticed not all has gone to plan. When we're yarding up there, I went up to the to the lead of the mob to um, to see if they were going in the yards all right. And uh, someone had left the gate open there, come through the other side of the yards. So uh, about 20 head got out of the yards. The mob of escapees head for a nearby herd of horses. So we had to unround them up and bring them back in and stop the rest of them going out of the yards too. One of the worst things to happen is for cattle to mix with horses when working with a helicopter. Oh, the horses usually take fright and uh, run away from the choppers, so 
Um, yeah, if they get in amongst, in amongst the cattle like that, they create all sorts of havoc. At the end of a long day and uh, to see that happen, it's uh, pretty average. Just one mistake has allowed cattle to escape and destroy a full day of hard work. The job is not complete until every beast is in and the gate is locked. The entrance to the yards is narrow. It quickly becomes congested with the sheer size of the mob. Cattle can easily get confused and start to look for ways to escape. Agile stockmen muster their own strength to restrain and return the runaway to the mob. There's a sense of purpose knowing this is the final hurdle. Everyone is needed to stick to the game plan. A team effort ensures every animal makes it through and is yarded. With the gate closed, the team feel a sense of satisfaction. The day's muster of 3,000 head of cattle is finally over. pilots are able to survey their day's work. But just when you think the job is done, all 3,000 cattle are to be sorted and tested. I thought you had him, Steve, that's what I left him for you. There's bulls out all the year round in Mulungwa and there's calves born mostly from uh, September through to about March. And uh, at, at about eight or ten months old, they're weaned off their mothers. The dangers for a stockman, uh, anywhere from being thrown, horse falling on you, you know, getting, getting knocked over by a beast in the yard. Give me, give me. Two wieners, one calf. Uh, the main reason we muster is, is obviously you pull off your, your, your meat work cattle, your sale cattle, pull wieners off and process your calves, brand them. You know, so you, you, know, you identify, identify your calves, so you brand them, you tag them. Oh, wow, hey! Hey, hey! Wiener! <laughs> Pregnant. Pregnant. Yeah, well, my job's probably the least glamorous of the whole show um, on pregnancy oh. testing. Pregnant. 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 Basically, is just uh, putting your hand up a cow's backside and seeing whether she's in calf or not. Pregnant. you just got to have your finger on what you're doing with your breeding of cattle nowadays. You just don't put the bulls out and hope you have a good calf. Putting the right bulls with the right cows has meant that Malungra breeds some of the world's best beef cattle. Testing for pregnant cows is vital in the process. It's a management tool, not very glamorous, but um, very accurate, and, and it just gives you good outcomes for your um, dollar pretty well. Pregnant, pregnant, yeah, pregnant, pregnant, empty. Ah! Go on, have you go, cows, go on. Once the yarding is finally complete, Pregnant cows are put back out to pasture. Calves are reunited with their mothers, and the adolescent cattle are weaned, ready to play their part in the beef industry. The road trains are filled.
The cattle are transported 1,000 kilometres to fattening properties to be prepared for processing. The mustering will continue at Malungra, with thousands more cattle still needed to be sorted before the wet season arrives. But at least for today, in the Queensland outback, the job is done and dusted. I think that's just such a good feeling when you finally shut the gate at the end of the day and you know all those cows are in the yards. Usually mate it's uh, well if nothing gets away it's a good day and mate it's the end of the day and generally pretty tired. Look forward to knocking off, having a cup of tea. It is a good feeling when you shut the gates, um, no matter what time it is, whether it's midday or six o'clock at night. Um, it's always nice to know that they're in the yards. It's just such a relief, like all your muscles that are sore just stop it and it's just such a good drive on the way home. All the dust will over your face and <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there is a sense of satisfaction if, if it's a good day. You know, some days it's, it's not, you know, things are going wrong, it's not as good, but it's good to knock off. When I have a beer at the end of the day, the first one doesn't even touch the sides. <laughs> At the end of the day, everyone comes together and the cook is a very much welcome part of the crew. It's been a long day, even by the standards of these top Australian cattle and horsemen. We were fortunate to inherit the aspirations and uh, heritage from our parents and our grandparents. We are custodians of the land. We look after to the best of our ability for the generations to come. Very uh, great privilege to be able to hand it on to my uh, sons and grandsons and granddaughters. Yeah, and I guess the land is, uh, is very important to people that have uh, dirt under their fingernails, so to speak, and uh, the young ones sometimes go away, but mostly they come back again because once you've got the, the land in the blood, you can take the, uh, the man from the land but not the the land from the man, as the saying goes. Australian farmers are very unique in many, many ways. 